I'll briefly just reintroduce myself. My name is Lauren Ferrari. I am the manager at Middle Creek Wildlife Management Area in Pennsylvania. And we are uh, located in the southeast part of Pennsylvania. We're about an hour and a half uh, west of Philadelphia. And we are a wildlife management area that is 6,254 acres. Now, for those of you who are out west, that might not seem like a lot of acreage, but for here in southeast Pennsylvania, where we have a lot of people, uh, it's actually a, gr a large area. And a, uh, we have a lot of different species that are utilizing this um, this wildlife management area. So uh, the premise for Middle Creek is that we're gonna talk about a little bit more is that we have a uh, 400 acre lake on the property that is a uh, roosting site or a reservoir for waterfowl. And so most of Middle Creek's uh, management uh, and history and heritage really stems from that waterfowl management. And we're gonna talk about waterfowl a little bit later. So as I mentioned, we're the Pennsylvania Game Commission. We are the state wildlife agency for Pennsylvania, and we are in charge of managing all wild birds and wild mammals in Pennsylvania. Uh, we are located in the southeast part of the state. So we're at this red dot right here. And if you can look at that, you'll see uh, there's a lot of other towns and cities around that. Some of you might recognize Hershey as Hershey chocolate. So that's in Pennsylvania. Here's Philadelphia. So we live within a very close proximity to a lot of people. So we have a lot of different user groups and a lot of people that visit us on a yearly basis. So I included this in here. One of the points of this talk is to talk to you about what it's like managing a wildlife management area. And this drawing kind of depicts what our decision processes are like every day. And the first thing you see at the top is that I know wildlife comes first. And with every decision we make on the property, this is the number one thing we try to keep in mind. We are here for wildlife first. Then after that, we try to take in our multiple user groups, uh, their, their interests and what they like to do on the property into account, but we always try our best to put wildlife first. And that's really important at Middle Creek because we are considered an important bird area, which is a designation through Audubon and BirdLife International. And we're only one of six places in Pennsylvania that has that designation. We have over uh, 280 species of birds that have been found at Middle Creek and 110 of them actually breed here too. So that's a lot of species considering uh, we only manage for 480 species in the state of Pennsylvania, including birds and mammals. So 280 of those 480 species, or I'm sorry, yeah, 280 are just birds that can be found here that doesn't even include mammals. So we have a lot of our state species found in one location. We do offer hunting opportunities as well. So we have five different hunting opportunities on the pro property here. And it's important to note that hunters pay for conservation, uh, just like in many states. So hunting license sales do help to uh, help us uh, make habitat on the ground, help our upkeep our facilities. Um, and we have uh, waterfowl hunting opportunities, deer hunting opportunities. We have a trapping hunting, trapping opportunity and also a managed dove opportunity here. We also are the home of the only visitor center that the Pennsylvania Game Commission currently owns. And we pull roughly 45,000 people through that visitor center, center annually. Uh, there's about 110,000 people that come to Middle Creek each year and about 2,000 students that are, um, that are educated through the doors of the center. This year looks a little different with COVID, but uh, we're glad that you're able to join us virtually today at least. And we have a lot of great exhibits in our, in our museum. Uh, in, a, in the visitor center, a lot of them have been recently updated, and these are uh, all interactive, really great for education. So education, we've already uh, started talking about a lot of things, uh, wildlife first, the hunting opportunities, and now we're talking about visitors with education. But we also have visitors that come and use our hiking trails too. So we have 12 different hiking trails on the property. Um, these are, are, it's over 20 different miles, and so we have to upkeep our trails as well. And you'll notice the different colors on the map. This is Middle Creek's Lake right here. Uh, the different colors represent areas that you can and cannot go on the property. So Middle Creek is very different than other public lands in Pennsylvania. We were formed a little bit differently. Our state game land system is roughly 1.5 million acres in the state of Pennsylvania. 
Uh, Middle Creek is, like I mentioned, 6,000 roughly of those 1.5 million acres. Um, so the green area is public hunting, public areas where there's no restrictions in terms of hunting. Yellow is what we call public recreation area. The only restriction there is waterfowl hunting. So we like to make sure that we don't have any hunting on the main lake because we do provide hunting on other parts of the property uh, that are specifically for waterfowl hunting. And the red and orange areas are areas that are closed to the public uh, with the exception of certain times of year for hunting opportunities and also if there are designated trails or roads that go through those areas. We also offer wildlife viewing opportunities. This is probably the number one use of our wildlife management area as we're very public one. Um, and we're most known for our snow goose migration, which happens every year uh, coming up actually, February through March. And we can get upwards of 100,000 plus birds here. Our uh, largest number was 200,000 birds, but uh, you can actually view the snow goose migration for yourself even in Nevada, New Mexico, Texas, wherever you're from, we have a wildlife uh, snow goose web camera that is up on our website. So if you Google Middle Creek snow goose web camera, you can actually watch the migration from your home and you'll get to see thousands and thousands of snow geese like in this picture here, uh, utilizing Middle Creek in the spring. One of the main things that we get to do on the, uh, as managers on the property is help create wildlife habitat. And Middle Creek is, uh, a lot of it is what we call early successional habitat. So a lot of fields uh, that are used for a variety of different uh, wildlife species, a lot of wetlands, a lot of areas that are not easily found in Pennsylvania since we're a mostly forested state. We do have some woods, uh, but we've really, uh, want to keep these early successional habitats here on the ground. And we do that through prescribed fire, through haying practices, maybe some herbicide treatment, but we've really tried to uh, focus on natural practices when possible. And the reason we do that is because we want habitat for all wildlife. So early successional habitat mixed with some uh, forested edges and wetlands is the reason why we have so many species of wildlife come here. Uh, and we even manage for pollinators. So these, uh, this field right here is a, gra a grass field that has uh, pollinators coming up, different forbs, wildflowers, and those will be utilized by so many different insects that you that make up the very bottom of that food web so uh, we manage even for insects to try to help uh, create better wildlife habitat we have a variety of nesting structures on the ground 250 plus bluebird boxes uh, 20 kestrel boxes some barn owl boxes an osprey platform um, we have volunteers as well that help us upkeep all of these nesting structures and help with our hiking trails and even pollinator gardens too. So volunteers are another uh, factor when you're talking about managing a wildlife management area. And finally, getting to the fun stuff that I think most of you would really enjoy seeing is talking about the hands-on work that we get to do with wildlife. So we talked about wildlife first, and when we talk about our research and the surveys we get to do, uh, this is where it really, um, uh, when we get down to what we're really looking at as far as numbers on the property and how we can create better habitat and, and make suitable uh, conditions for wildlife. So we do a lot of different surveys from counting uh, breeding birds to counting the snow geese to counting different waterfowl to counting bats, uh, banding kestrels. But one of the main thing we get to do here is uh, work with waterfowl, as I mentioned, and duck banding is one of those efforts that we get to do. So with duck banding, uh, this is a process that we do twice a year here. And this photo uh, is a picture of me holding a pintail. Um, and so uh, one of the neat things that connects Pennsylvania to even you out in the Western side or central part of the country is that we have the same, a lot of the same waterfowl species that you do. So uh, pintail, mallards, wood ducks, all of these species can be found in Pennsylvania, but also where you're located at as well. So how does one catch a duck? How, how do we do this? And I'm gonna show you the process and explain a little bit more why we do it. Um, but the, how we do it is we have these metal traps that we put in the water and we uh, bait them with corn. And this is outside any hunting seasons. So that's very important because we wanna make sure that we're not putting, these, uh, putting artificial bait on the uh, property when uh, there's hunting seasons involved. So um, we'll put this corn out, we'll put the traps out, and those birds get used to coming into the corn without the trap being there. So when we finally set the trap out on the landscape, 
the ducks will go in through this little funnel right here and they get stuck in the trap and they can't figure out how to get back out. And this little board here is just a picture of, of the duck resting on the board. A lot of time that board allows them to get out of water, but it also allows us to display corn so they can visually see uh, the bait out of the water since it's bright yellow. So we'll check our traps twice a day. This is very important because we don't want the ducks to be there in there overnight. Uh, if they're in there overnight, they're susceptible to predators, which can be, uh, we don't want that to happen. So we want to make sure that these ducks come in the trap and leave just as healthy as they were. They just get a little bracelet. So I'll explain that to you. So we're going to check the traps. We get them out with a net. This is just one style of trap. There's a lot of different ways that you can do it. Um, we'll take the duck out of the trap. And we'll, I, uh, depending on how many ducks I have, I use different um, types of containers to put them in. But in this case, I'm just using a burlap bag because there's only one. And we're gonna take them back to the shore where we'll actually ban them. And I do have a video here for you guys to, to watch. I hope that this is a lot more exciting than me showing pictures. So I'm gonna play this video for the next seven minutes. Uh, and I hope you uh, can uh, learn something from it. And then we'll talk about the why of duck banding on the back side of this video. So I'll go ahead and just got to change my screen to show you. Okay, Steve, can you give me a thumb up? So we have our ducks, we're back at our banding mobile. Um, and just to briefly talk to you about what bands are, um, they are a, a small metal uh, aluminum band that has a nine digit number on it that is specific to that bird. So no other bird will ever get that band. And depending on the size of the bird, you can have different size bands. So this is a, a larger band and these are much smaller bands. Um, so no matter what duck we actually catch, we can band it. I do have bands for them, but most of the ducks that we catch in Pennsylvania are mallards and wood ducks, but we do have a few exceptions here today that we'll show you. And sometimes the ducks that we catch have bands on them already. So that could mean that they're ducks that were caught already this year or that they were caught previous years. I'll get the one banded bird out. So we call these recaptures, meaning that we've already caught them already. Okay, so this is a, a wood duck. Um, if you're not familiar with duck species, wood ducks are um, a fairly small species of duck in Pennsylvania. Um, this particular one, as I mentioned, already has a band on it, so you can see that. Um, and this band was actually put on this year. So I don't need to take a lot of data from this bird because I've already banded it this year. If she, if this bird were to be caught the previous year, I would write that band number down and we would report it back to the bird banding lab, which is um, in they're run by USGS, U US Geological Survey. And they are kind of the house for all banded birds in North America, uh, ducks, um, passerines, uh, like songbirds, raptors, you name it, they are in charge of the uh, database for that. So, so this is a wood duck, <clears throat> and as I mentioned, she's uh, this particular duck's already banded, and I don't have another wood duck to compare. But this is a female, and the way that we know that is because her beak is black. There's not a lot of coloration on it. Her eyes are dark, whereas males will have almost kind of a red color eye. But the most distinctive thing that you can tell from her face here is this white eye ring around her eye that makes it a female as well. Um, and when you bring her wing out, there's some coloration there, but uh, not a lot. Male wood ducks are very colorful. Uh, they're probably one of the most colorful birds in Pennsylvania. <clears throat> and so females are usually not as colorful because they're the ones that sit on the nest. So they want to blend into their surroundings a little bit more. But because we already have a ban on this bird and we don't need any other information, we're gonna let her go. And then when you let a duck go, you can just throw them up in the air and they fly away. Looks simple on camera. <laughs> so, all right, so the next duck we're gonna get out if you wanna grab one for me. Um, these are a little bit more unique. Um, we don't really have a lot of these breeding in Pennsylvania, but they do come through in migration and we're banding. It's September, so we're right on schedule with their migration, but they're one of uh, these smallest ducks in Pennsylvania. 
And this is the blue wing teal. So you can see from Jordan holding it here, that blue coloration on the wing. But the very first thing we wanna do with a duck that's not banded is put a band on it. In case it gets away, we know it's a blue wing teal. I know just from banding a few of these, looking at it, what, um, what age and if it's a boy or a girl. Um, but we'll show you the full process here. So uh, one thing I forgot to mention is that each pliers is specific to the type of band. So uh, teal, like I mentioned, are pretty small. So they're gonna take a size four. Wood ducks take a size five. So the bigger the band number, the bigger the band. So for example, uh, Canada geese take a size eight, um, but teal are the smallest band that we're gonna be using here for ducks today. So I wanna open that band up off of the string just wide enough that I can get it on the bird's foot. And you wanna make sure you're putting these bands on in sequential order. And just kind of a protocol thing, we always band the bird on the right foot. So I'm gonna grab his right foot. I'm backwards here, sorry. That's okay, <laughs> I don't wanna hold this. You're good. Okay, so I'm gonna take um, the pliers and go up underneath his foot and do a quarter turn, making sure I'm not pinching his toe in there. I'm gonna squeeze pretty firmly. You can squeeze as hard as you can and it's never gonna overlap the bird, uh, the band on the bird's leg. And I'm just gonna crimp it slightly to make sure that it's closed all the way. You wanna make sure because ducks are swimming a lot in water, uh, there's a lot of debris and we wanna make sure nothing's gonna actually get stuck on that. So can you show them how close the band is? You can see it's completely closed. Nothing's gonna get in there and it still is spinning really freely. Perfect. Good to go? Not yet. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, forgot the age. And yep, that. so we gotta take it. And this happens a lot. Like I said, this is why we put the band on first. I'm gonna make sure I record the band number in my, my data notebook. And as I mentioned, it is a blue wing teal. Um, as far as identifying species of birds, this one is pretty easy because it actually has a blue wing. And teal, like I mentioned, are, are fairly small. We have another teal in Pennsylvania called the green wing teal, which is even smaller than the blue wing. So I'm gonna steal them from you. Thank you. All right, so when you're looking at teal uh, and when you're banding ducks, there's a few other pieces of information we want. So we wanna put the band on, know what the species is, and what the age and sex of the bird is. So um, for blue wing teal, Hopefully we'll have a few more to show you here. Um, when you're pulling out that wing, you're gonna notice that really defined blue spot. Um, and then that white patch underneath it, followed by another uh, greenish colored patch. So that prominent amount of blue in this duck is a sign that this is a male. The other thing you can look at are his feet. They're pretty yellow. And when we get a female out, you'll see the difference. So this is a male blue wing teal. The other thing you can do, which I'm not going to do, is called a uh, process called venting. It's actually pushing down on their cloaca to see if it's a boy or a girl. So you can look at that as well. So this is a male. And then when you're determining age at this time of year, a, a thing that you can look at, and when we say age, I'm only looking at hatch year and after hatch year. So hatch year would be a duck that was born this year. After hatch year is a duck that's born previous years. But a good telltale sign that you're gonna be looking at is tail feathers. So if you look at those tail feathers, you'll notice that they have, um, they're kind of wispy, they have, a lot of, they have a lot of damage to them and they have this upside down V notching. So that's a good sign that this is actually a younger duck. He has, uh, they're just younger feathers that haven't molted yet. And pulling out the rest of his wing, there's a few other signs that we can look at as well, but for the purposes of this video, um, this is a young duck and we're gonna let him go. Off he goes. Okay, so we're gonna get back here. I'm gonna try to go back to my next screen, sorry. Okay, share. Okay, so hopefully that gave you a little bit of insight to what duck banding is. And I know we're running out of time here, so I have uh, two more slides. 
Uh, and the next slide I'm gonna talk about is just the whys, why we're banding ducks and why it's so important. So waterfowl is considered a game species uh, and, and the ducks that we were capturing in that, in that video, the wood ducks and the teal are all birds that can be harvested by hunters. So uh, they are a migratory species, which means that they, this is a photo of the, obviously the uh, Eastern part of the United States, which we call the Atlantic flyway. Um, and this is showing where birds that have been banded have been harvested or found by hunters or other people that are um, by other banders. Um, this looks like, yeah, this is direct band recovery of mallards. So that could be uh, through banding efforts or through harvest from hunters. So uh, you'll notice where Middle Creek is, is this bright red place right here. That's where we band a lot of waterfowl. But this is where all of the ducks in Pennsylvania that are banded in Pennsylvania can go. So it's really interesting to see where these ducks go to and from. Uh, we can determine how old ducks can get to because of the bands. We know what year we put the band on so we can figure out, okay, this bird lived to be a really long time uh, or to be really old. But the main point is to see what the harvest is. We want to know how many of the birds are actually being harvested. And the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, I, I know some of you might have been joining a National Wildlife Refuge talk before this. They are actually in charge of setting all the bag uh, seasons and bag limits for waterfowl species so that we're uh, even though we're harvesting them, we're harvesting responsibly that's, and we're not putting a detrimental effect on to the populations of certain species. So banding is one of the hugest data sets and we've been doing it for decades. And it really helps us to uh, know exactly what's going on in the landscape as far as hunter harvest. So uh, we get a lot more information about it. Like you see some birds that have been com coming over here in Wisconsin, maybe Minnesota. Um, I've caught birds from these areas as well. Um, and they're, you know, males and excuse me, females following each other back and forth. And that's important too, because sometimes there's wildlife diseases on the um, landscape as well. We have to be concerned of like avian influenza. Uh, where we live in uh, Lemon and Lancaster counties in Pennsylvania is very high uh, poultry industry with chickens and turkeys. So having avian influenza in our wild ducks could be very detrimental for those domestic species. So uh, very interesting research we get to do and one of my favorite parts of my job. So Middle Creek is not a national wildlife refuge, but uh, it's a state version of a national wildlife refuge. Many of our other play, other uh, game lands are not as heavily used as Middle Creek. So this is a very uh, unique situation for Pennsylvania. Um, a lot of our other game lands are not, uh, don't have hike, designated hiking trails, don't have areas that are closed to the public, don't have a visitor center. So Middle Creek is very different, uh, but we do take pride that we are the most, you know, one of the most heavily visited game lands in the state uh, or public areas areas that people like to come and visit. Um, and we try to share our property with both our consumptive and non-consumptive users, hunters and, and non-hunters, bird watchers, wildlife enthusiasts. Um, and for the most part, it, it works out really well, but it can be difficult. So you really need uh, our guiding principle, as I mentioned already, is, is wildlife first. And we really base all of our decisions on that. I think I'm out of time here, so I hope that you've enjoyed uh, this presentation. And uh, if you would like to um, see any more information about um, Middle Creek, we do have a website. Uh, if you search Middle Creek through the Pennsylvania Game Commission, it'll take you right to that. Thank you, Steve and Lauren. Fabulous job. Thank you, attendees. And that's all for now. Bye, everybody. Thank you.